So let's start talking about two dimensional transistors. Now, before I start, just to understand like the impact of this research and like how important it is, I want to talk about the players involved. So you got MIT, you got UC Berkeley, you got Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, National Taiwan University, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, and the research is funded by NSF, United States Army, I think United States Navy, a lot of big money coming in, a lot yeah, of parties so you're interested. Telling me, a lot of people who are very important and care a lot about this research, so I should pay attention. Exactly. That's really the main point I'm driving home here. Just like, listen to me. This was a little dense, so I've tried to make it as easy to understand as possible, but bear with me. Clarify as needed. Let's get it rolling. So before we start talking about anything transistor related, we got to talk about Moore's Law. What is Moore's Law? It's this idea that every year we should be able to double the number of transistors that are within a chip. The reason transistors are important is because they're like the logic gates, the yes or the no's, the zeros or the ones. So the more of them you have on a chip, the more power you're able to get out of the chip. That's the basic idea. Okay. Now, as time has gone on, we've hit like some potholes here and there. Um, specifically in 2000 to 2007, we hit a manufacturing pothole where the advances were kind of stifled. And it wasn't until 3D architecture manufacturing process of transistors came into play in 2007 that we were able to pick it back up again and keep the good times rolling with the massive innovation that was coming out. But once again, we might be reaching a bottleneck. And this time, it's about the physical constraints. So we've, we've started to get so small that we might just not be able to fit any more onto the, the wafer, the semiconductor wafer. Okay, but so since... 1965, that's when Gordon Moore said mm -hmm. his Moore's Law. He was the CEO of uh, Fairchild Semiconductor and then Intel. Basically, since 1965, for the most part, we've been able to stick with this law of doubling the amount of transistors in, you know, in a semiconductor chip every year. We hit some bumps along the road. You say we're coming up to another bottleneck. Mm -hmm. What's the solution here? You know, we overcame it in 2007. What can we do to fix this next bottleneck? I, I, love, I love the question. So the solution a lot of people believe is two-dimensional materials. And again, for context, two-dimensional is an, a material that is a few atoms thick. So like extremely, extremely thin. Okay. And the reason they believe, that the, the community believes that this could be the next step forward is because of this thing called the channel length. Um, the analogy I want to use here, tell me if it's good or not. I thought it was a pretty good way of explaining things. Imagine there's a river and you have two sides of the river. Now to get over it, you got to build a bridge. Let's imagine that the bridge itself is the transistor gate, the thing that's going on and off. And on one okay. side, you have this source. And on the other side, you have this drain where the current is traveling. So the distance between the source and the drain is the channel length. The smaller the channel length, the more transistors you should be able to fit on any given space. So right now, the, the smallest channel lengths that we have in the industry, the, the leaders are anywhere between 5 to 10 nanometers. But going with the two-dimensional route, scientists believe that we can increase the number of transistors we are fitting on a chip tenfold. So okay. we can keep wow. Moore's Law going for a couple more years. Exactly. Okay. So basically, we're just looking at these really, really thin materials because it helps us reduce the overall form factor of every single transistor, mm -hmm. increase the density on a chip, by you know 10 times which is way more than what uh, gordon moore wants us to do every year with 2xing so we've we're able to you know push push off moore's law for a few more years into the future exactly that that's exactly right but with all great things there are some limitations and the one that i want to talk about really quickly is called the metal induced gap state and what that might lead to is the formation of shot key barriers so real quick all you really need, I, that's a lot of words i understand yeah, but yeah. what you need to know here is that whenever a metal makes contact with that two-dimensional semiconducting sheet um there's this like shot key barrier which is a phenomenon that inhibits the flow of electrons right so if you're inhibiting the flow they're not able to go from the source to the drain that well and the efficiency comes down overall. So you want to basically get that to zero. The way they got around this is actually pretty interesting. It's a simple solution. Instead of using metal connections, they started using semi-metal connections. A semi-metal has a conductivity between a metal and a semiconductor. And the one they used here was bismuth. By using bismuth, they completely got rid of this metal-induced gap states that were happening. Awesome. Great. But now there's another issue. You have... Um, Again, you have metal contacts that whenever they make 
contact with the semiconducting sheet, the resistance is too high. And if you have an apparatus and instrument to be able to understand what's happening on the circuit board. So Dan, you know, we've taken electric circuit analysis courses. We use voltmeters and amp meters. Yeah. They send little signals from one point of the circuit to the other to understand what's going on. But if the resistance is too high, those, those signals are disappearing and they're not able to understand what's happening and they can't develop that well. Does okay, that make sense? So, yeah, we've got these thin materials now. Um, we think it's the future. The pros of it is that it can greatly reduce the size of these transistors, which will help us increase the density of them holding on to Moore's law. Mm -hmm. The cons are that there's sometimes the shock key barrier thing, which basically like this thin material mixed with the metal, the electrical properties aren't that good. And then also we have high resistance. They think they've solved one of those issues already, which is the shock key barrier by replacing the typical metal with a semi-metal. So it seems like we've taken a lot of steps in the right direction for using 2D semiconductor materials. So can you help me like do a gut check to where we are in terms of reality? When will this become, you know, part of the chip that I buy and put in my PC next time I build one? Absolutely. So there's still some work to be done, but this is like a monumental step that that was taken in the two dimensional transistor development field. I'm going to shoot some numbers at you real quick. The contact resistance with the inclusion of bismuth, that, that's one of the big discoveries. The secret sauce, we haven't said this episode yet. The secret sauce, yeah. the bismuth, resulted in a 123 ohm micrometer contact resistance, which is the lowest recorded ever, at least to the researchers that were writing this. And the on-state current density, that's the density of the current going from the source to the drain, is 1,135 microamps per micrometer on the new two-dimensional uh base that they're using and that is also the highest that's ever been recorded okay so th th so, these are two big uh, parameters to keep in mind like big performance measurements you want to reduce yes. the resistance maximize the current density and they got the best ever marks in both of those categories ever known to man at least at the time this research was discovered exactly and by being able to reduce that contact resistance, they've kind of like cracked a, a big hurdle and now they're able to keep developing, keep reducing. And again, you asked a good question, when can I see it in my laptop or other electronics? Making this, any chip really commercial and getting manufacturing figured out is a big step. So I'm honestly not sure to be, on, to be like fair, but anytime in the next five years or so, I wouldn't be like, I don't think it's out of the realm of reality to start seeing this, maybe in prototype stuff first, may maybe like some experimental designs, but I, I think we're getting closer than ever before. And having all this extra power, all this extra um, density, it probably, it might get us uh, a step further towards quantum computing as well, I imagine. Definitely, definitely. We're starting to understand better what happens in two dimensional on the sub nano scale, which is a pr perfect segue to get into the quantum realm.